But as the light comes into the situation, you will come to know what is true about you. And the truth about the situation isn't shame and guilt. Because as you look and see who you truly are, as you look and see what it is you actually do, you also see Jesus. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, from our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, today we get to talk about the darkness of denial, and uh, if I may be permitted at least one dad joke in this sermon, it's not just a river in Egypt. Sorry, I had to get that one out of my system. Denial. All right, now as soon as I thought of the word denial, I played the free association game, and the first thing I came up with was a picture in my head. But in order to get to that picture, I have to show you this one first. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is an ostrich. You all know about ostriches, right? I think they have a couple over at the zoo, right? They're not native to North America, but they are wonderful creatures, amazing. Uh, they, they grow about seven feet tall is the average height, Unless it's one from North Africa and it has a pink body, then it's probably about nine feet. Wow. Right? They weigh about 250 pounds, and at the smallest possible point, their leg is already two inches in diameter. Because these things are machines built for pure speed. They reach 50 miles an hour. That's speeding down some of these streets. Right? So here's an ostrich. A big, intimidating animal. But here's the picture that popped into my head. You've probably all seen that one before. An ostrich burying its head in the sand. Now, I remember having this image in my head, and it was explained to me at one point when I was a younger kid that what's going on here is a defense mechanism. This is what I was taught. Now, I'll see if any of you were taught this as well. That what the ostrich is doing here is burying its head in the sand because it thinks that if its predator can't see him, or if he can't see his predator, right? There we go. If he can't see his predator, then his predator can't see him. That's what I was taught. Anybody else? Okay, at least like two people. All right, so the rest of you, great. You're well educated. We actually know what's going on here. Which is to say, um, their head happens to be the most sensitive to temperature. And you can see that's a male by the black and white feathers. And it's the dad's job to take care of the eggs and the nest. And so when they dip their head down in the hole where the eggs are, they're checking the temperature to make sure everything is still warm enough. Right? So we now know better, but it didn't change the fact that for years and years and years, this was explained as what it was. And that's where we get the phrase, burying one's head in the sand. And sometimes we even call it the ostrich effect. And whereas this large, flightless bird has every excuse in the world to bury his head in the sand, the Pharisees that we see today did not. Especially throughout the rest of the gospel accounts. But in order to understand why, we need to understand who these people are and where they come from. Because that's kind of important in this story. So we have this group of people called the Pharisees. The earliest we hear about them is about the second century BC. And it happens to come about the same time. uh, A guy by the name of Alexander the Great, you might remember from your history books. Yeah, he's out and he's conquered the whole world. Well, that Macedonian culture is having quite an effect. And they're concerned with the increasing Greek. And then, later on, after Julius Caesar, Roman influence in their land and in their countries. They are uniquely concerned in wanting to keep Jewish tradition alive because they had read the Old Testament. And and everywhere in the Old Testament, God talks about how you're not supposed to be like the nations around you. You're supposed to be something different. You are sacred. You are set apart. You are my people. So this all starts out with, with, with wanting to keep what is good alive. And in order to do that, they do exactly as the prophets direct them to. They dedicate themselves to Torah, and they take it very seriously. They take a look at God's word and take it very seriously. 
This is all well and good. This is everything that you're supposed to do. And when the prophets speak in the book of the Twelve, or even the major prophets themselves, this is exactly God's recipe. When, when this kind of change comes, dedicate yourself to what I have taught, the teaching I have given. And everything's going along great until about the 20s A.D. Because it's in the 20s A.D., there springs up this guy. He's from up in the North Country. His name happens to be Jesus, right? And he's preaching. He's doing some miracles. And this is all really awesome, actually. This is pretty great. But some of the things he does are peculiar. Because some of the miracles he does, some of the works that he does, some of the things his disciples are doing, he does it on Sabbath. Now remember, they take Torah very seriously. Does anybody remember the third commandment? Oh, yeah, Sabbath day. There we go. Somebody got it right. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. If you go back to Exodus chapter 20, right, or you go to the book of Deuteronomy, and you find out if you break the Sabbath, what the penalty was, you find out God took this command very seriously. So they took it very seriously. So now here's this Jesus guy doing stuff on a Sabbath, and you're like, what's up with that? Then they hear his preaching. And in his preaching, he seems to include people like Gentiles. And even, if you could believe it, Samaritans. That strikes at the very heart of everything the Pharisees were all about. God's word having room for Goyim, for Samaritans. We're here trying to keep this truth alive. So when they're presented with truth from the mouth of Jesus, they act like a large flightless bird. They bury their heads in the sand. And in the encounter that we heard about today from John chapter 8, you and I get to see just how far down they are willing to bury their heads. Most famously, it's right here in verse 33. So they answered him and they said, We are the offspring of Abraham, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. I love this line because it shows a whole bunch of denial. They might not even mean to do it, but they walk right into it. They say, we have never been enslaved to anyone. Well, guys, I got bad news. They caught it on film. As a matter of fact, it happens to be one of the key features of the Torah. We've never been slaves to anyone. Now, hold on, guys. You're the sons of Abraham. Of course you were. But they were in a dark state of denial. To deny the truth that was in front of them, it caused them to say words. Words they probably didn't even understand what they were saying because those words denied God's grand work of the Exodus. And any even introductory student of God's Torah knows the whole point of it is that God led his people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. They had denied God's wonderful work in the Exodus by saying that they had never been slaves. They had denied the central focus of everything they had held dear. And to deny it is to forget what God has done and everything that the prophets truly warn against. They were in denial. And this just shows you the danger, I guess you could say, of denial. Because denial is a self-inflicted wound. You're presented with something, and then when you're presented with information that, that, that doesn't make sense, you can just deny it. And then we can all move on. And how deep your denial goes, well, that's completely up to you. You can choose when to stop denying. So you get to choose just how deep this thing goes, just how dark you want it to be. You get to make the world around you as shadowed as you would have it. And we like it pretty dark, to be honest. Light has a way of showing things. 
it has an annoying way of, of revealing things that we would rather not see. A well-lit room shows dirt and dust very well. Now you and I, we're pretty good people, aren't we? Right? Pretty good people. You all pay your bills, right? As much as you can, right? You, know, you pay them on time. And it's almost that time of year, right? April's coming up. So you all pay your taxes. Do a good job with that, right? Um, let's see. Uh, you probably all take care of the responsibilities that you have. Great. And, and to top it all, let's put a cherry on top of this. You're probably nice. At least from what I've seen, you all tend to be pretty nice people, right? So we're pretty good. We're all pretty good. And everything's going along just fine in terms of how we see ourselves until this guy, this preacher from up north country in Galilee named Jesus, walks into our midst. Now, some of the things going on are absolutely great with this Jesus guy. He, he talks to us about how we, we would be set free indeed. He, he talks to us about how, how we will be God's chosen people. We're, we're all in on this. There's room for me and for you. But where it starts, it's kind of different. The first words that Jesus preaches in his earthly ministry are repent. And the bulk of Jesus' teaching, the bulk of Jesus' teaching revolves around the realities of the human condition. That we're sinners. Even worse, that we're, we're sinful. That our desires are marked by sin. That we're not the good people we tend to think we are. And this goes just a touch deeper than our good deeds aren't as good as we make them out to be. It's not just a simple, oh, we puff up the good things that we do. Because Jesus says in this same passage from John chapter 8, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And there, there's no caveat to that. There, there's no... There, there's no strategizing or strat, strat, I can't even think of the word, but there's no strata of sin. It's not just the big ones or the little ones. It's not just the ones that no one knows about. And as a matter of fact, the ones that people don't notice are probably especially the ones that are the deepest and darkest. It's especially those ones that we go to great lengths to cover up. The ones that well, we deny are true of who we are. We don't want that stuff getting out. We choose those chains. At first, it, it definitely doesn't even seem like slavery because it's, it's an indulgence when, when we do it. It feels good. It doesn't seem like there's any kind of drawback. <laughs> it's not like I'm hurting anyone, right? Not out here killing people. It's not what I'm talking about. At least that's how we justify it to ourselves. So we deny our problem. We bury our heads in the sand. Deeper, deeper, darker and darker, maybe even to the point where we deny that it's a problem at all. To the point where we even begin to think, I don't have a problem. And then Jesus, when he hears it, he says, those who are well have no need of a physician. And here he's speaking to some Pharisees again. But it's the sick I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the work that Jesus has come to do. And before long, we find ourselves like Pharisees. We find ourselves like large, flightless birds, so deep in denial that we end up denying God's wonderful work in our lives. 
This doesn't have to be where the whole situation ends up. This, this state of denial doesn't have to be the final word. Because when, when we stop denying that we have a problem, we come to know what is true of us. And it starts in this place. It starts in this reality that we are in fact fallen and sinful. And maybe at first, that's like turning the lights on in a dark room. Y'all ever done that? It happens to me every morning about 6 a.m. when the girls come racing into the room and turn on all the lights. And my reaction is like what? You all know, right? It hurts. It's almost painful because it's been so dark. My eyes are so well adjusted. And at first I can't even see who's in the room or what's going on. The light is too intense and too bright. And in thinking about dealing with what might be revealed by that light, I'd say, turn it off, I want to go back to sleep. And when we start to engage with this, when we stop denying and the lights come on, the the feelings of shame and guilt might be the first ones that make us want to bury our head even deeper. Because we don't want to come back up and out. We don't want to deal with this. But as the light comes into the situation, you will come to know what is true about you. And the truth about the situation isn't shame and guilt. Because as you look and see who you truly are, as you look and see what it is you actually do, you also see Jesus. If you turn your eyes, you see clearly this wonderful reality that John goes on to write in his epistle. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Once the denial stops, we get to see who we truly are, but we get to see even more who God truly is and how he's already been at work. In seeing what we've done and who we truly are, it paints a crystal clear picture of what God has truly done for a sinner like myself, of what God has truly done for you. You will, in fact, see your sin. You will see your shame. You will see your guilt, but you will see it carried to the cross with Jesus so that it can go there to die with him. And he does that so that here at this font, When water joins with his wonderful word, the promise can be given. So that the sun can set you free from the darkness. He can set you free from guilt and shame. He can set you free from every chain that sin would gladly throw around your neck and clasp around your hands. And this is truly wonderful news. Because if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Come soon, Lord Jesus. Amen.